Start with some tragic news. ESPN has just learned that boxer Maxime Dadashev has died from injuries suffered during Friday's fight in Washington, D.C. This, according to his camp, including his trainer, Buddy McGirt, who threw in the towel after the 11th round of that fight. Dadashev had been in a Maryland hospital since the loss to Sabriel Batayas. He was helped from the ring and threw up upon leaving. He was then put on a stretcher and taken out of the arena and transported to the hospital. The Dashev underwent a two-hour surgery to relieve a subdural hematoma or bleeding of the brain and had been in a medically induced coma. The Dashev, a previously unbeaten fighter, was 28 years old. Let's bring in Steve Kim, who's been covering the story since Friday and was actually at the fight. Steve, what can you tell us about what's happened over the last 24 hours? Well, uh, you know, not a lot of information could be released with the HIPAA regulations, which strictly prohibited um, medical status and things of that sort to be released to the public without the family's consent. Now, the wife who came from Russia, she did not arrive to Reagan National till last night. From what I was told was by Carl Moretti of Comp Rank that right around 6 a.m. Eastern time, he had gotten a phone call from the manager, Igus Kleinus, who told him at that point that it would only be a matter of hours before Mr. Datashoff would pass away. And then that news was confirmed by Donatus Genesis Vicious. He was the strength and conditioning coach that was left behind to kind of be the point person and the liaison to everybody while everyone else had to leave uh, Maryland this past weekend. And it was confirmed uh, just about, I would say about, about an hour or so ago by everyone involved that indeed Mr. Datashoff had died. Steve, in watching that fight, did you have the impression that something should have been done before his corner threw in the towel? You know, I have to be honest. In that particular instance, I felt the stoppage of Buddy McGirt made after the 11th round, which is a very tough physical one for Dadashev. I can't second guess it. I really can't. While Fabrio Matias was clearly winning the fight, Dadashev actually had some moments in rounds 8 and 9 and maybe even 10. And, and their plan was to take Matthias into the late rounds and hopefully fatigue would set in and that he would fade. Unfortunately, that never happened. No one ringside. There was not a consensus that McGirt or the rest of that corner was really late in making that decision. This, to me, was the hardest type of fight to really stop, given the circumstances. While the fight was somewhat one-sided, it was just competitive enough and there were enough signs that Dadashev had earned the right to continue. And I really thought, to me, the, the stoppage at the time of the fight was absolutely perfect. I, I can't say anything different. Steve Kim, our ESPN.com boxing writer, was there for that fight, joining us now on this terrible news. Let's bring in uh, First Takes Max Kellerman, a longtime boxing analyst for the network. Max, just your first thoughts on, on hearing the news today. This is a tragedy. I, you know, the story of Dadashev, he was fighting for his green card, basically. Every fight was hoping to become a citizen and eventually and bring over his wife and small child. Uh, he was a human interest story before the tragedy. And, and the fight, uh, you heard Steve just talk about it. You, normally, I can tell when a fight needs to be stopped. This is a kind of ring tragedy style fight. Generally, it happens when one opponent has a really good chin and a lot of heart, can take a lot of punishment, and is fighting just well enough against another fighter who's landing a lot of punches but is not a devastating puncher. So there's no obvious moment for the referee to stop the fight. Normally, though, that's how these tragedies happen. They're not like second-round knockouts normally by one punch. It's an accumulation of shots with a fighter with too much heart for his own good. Normally, by the middle rounds, you could say, whoa, this is getting to be a dangerous fight. I never got the sense of that in this fight. Now, when, he, when uh, Matthias landed the last shot that sent the Dashev reeling at the end of the 11th, I thought, uh-oh, I don't like the way the Dashev stepped, he, like he didn't know where the canvas was. There's a certain way that fighters react when you think something bad may happen late in a grueling fight. Um, and I did get that impression at that moment, but not before that moment. And in fact, right after that moment, the bell rang to end the 11th, and then McGirt stopped the fight. Now, I did think as soon as the fight was stopped, I was sitting with Mark Kriegel and Andre Ward and said, you know, we, they need to monitor this closely. This is the kind, the way he looked at the end. I didn't like it. And they agreed, yeah, I didn't like the way he looked at the very end either. And sure enough, as is normally the case in ring tragedy kind of fights, he starts, he starts needing to be held up on his way back to the dressing room, which normally happens. It's not right after the end of the fight, but even sometimes in fights where a fighter simply decisioned, 
in a kind of fight like that. He needs help walking, and then he feels nauseated, and then he starts vomiting, blood. That normally means there's pressure in his head. There's bleeding or swelling of the brain. And that was the case in, in, in this instance. I, I don't think it was that they took too long to get him to the hospital, though I don't know. I don't think that there was any culpability in terms of, even though there wasn't a perfect moment to stop the fight, people, you know, the ring doctor or the, or the state commission or the coroner or the ref did a bad job. I don't think that was the case. This is just one of those perhaps unavoidable consequences from time to time of an extremely violent and dangerous sport that I love. Unavoidable consequences from time to time. We, we've seen this periodically go way back when Duck Koo Kim dying after a, a fight with, with uh, I think, Ray Mancini at the time. What ramifications does this have throughout the sport of boxing when someone dies from boxing-related injuries? Normally, again, normally you look at what went wrong, what could have been handled differently. I did not see an obvious uh, instance of that in this case. I, I, I presume that they, it will be taken, you know, did, what were, did they get him out of the building and to the hospital fast enough? Things like that. But I wouldn't say th this wasn't even an issue in my view of a fight where some, sometimes a fighter's doing well enough to stay in the fight, but he's just taking too much punishment. I've even seen, I believe it was Prince Charles Williams, Marquis Sosa in the 19, late 80s, maybe, where the fight was simply stopped by a conscientious state athletic commissioner, Larry Hazard, who was there saying, you know what, these guys have taken too much punishment. And I believe it was stopped and called a draw based on, on something like uh, some uh, um, too much brutality. Like, literally, I, we can't say there's going to be a winner. This is just getting too brutal. We need to stop it. I did not see that. This fight as that kind of fight. The Dashev was doing well early, and though his opponent came on as the fights, as the rounds mounted, I didn't see a bunch of devastating headshots that would lead me to believe, or from the Dashev's reactions, this is getting too much. You did get the feeling, okay, the Dashev's just about had it, probably a good time to stop the fight. But until that final shot in the 11th round, I wasn't, my, 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 my uh, antenna weren't up in terms of, uh-oh, ring tragedy fight. So my short answer is, I don't know what you learn from a fight like this, other than um, it is a, a violent and dangerous sport, and it is a guilty pleasure and for me. And, and, and there are, you know, you have to ask yourself ethical and moral questions in times like this about, about supporting the sport. And yet I consistently come down on the side of I love boxing. I'm glad it exists. And, and this stuff happens sometimes. Dashev, previously unbeaten before the fight, a Russian, his wife reportedly on the way en route to the United States from Russia again. Max, with the very latest on the death of Maxim Dadashev because of injuries suffered in the ring Friday night, Dadashev, 28 years old. For those just now joining us, I'm Carrie Champion, and we welcome you in to Coast to Coast. Let's turn to football now because today is the day we are live at Chiefs Camp as rooks and quarterbacks report. In just a moment, we'll give you a live report, but first, let's give you the background. Patrick Mahomes coming off a season in which he was the first NFL MVP in Chiefs history, and he'll try to become the fifth player to repeat as an MVP. On Friday, the NFL announced Tyreek Hill would not be suspended despite allegations of child abuse, and Chiefs said that he will rejoin the team for the start of their training camp. Meanwhile, Mahomes and Hill are back, but the defense will have to look new because they have Eric Berry gone and the additions of Tyron Matthew and Frank Clark, among others. Notable moves. We'll put all that into context right now. Let's welcome in our Jeff Darlington. So, Jeff, you are in uh, St. Joseph, Missouri. Thank you so much for being here. As mentioned, Chiefs, but Rooks, and quarterbacks report to camp today. Patrick Mahomes is scheduled to speak to the media at 2 Eastern. So let's start right there. What are the team's expectations from their quarterback? Well, Kerry, the expectations are absolutely massive. And I can tell you right now, look, Patrick Mahomes is reporting with the rookies today, and this is mandatory viewing for us. We're going to be here just to hear him speak. A year ago, certainly, we would not have been saying the same thing when Mahomes was showing up to camp when he won't even be on the field throwing passes just yet. But he will be here this week. He'll be thrown to the rookies tomorrow and the next day, probably get Friday off before the veterans then report on Saturday. But by all means, a player who's coming off of just the second 
season in NFL history with 50 touchdowns and 5,000 passing yards. Now trying to win two more games this year to get himself that Super Bowl ring. The reigning MVP reporting here to St. Joseph, and he says he is ready to go. All right, so another storyline clearly we've been following with this organization for some time now was Tyreek Hill investigation. Uh, the NFL has announced it will not suspend him. What's been the reaction to that announcement there in Missouri? Well, this too is interesting today because as we do have the rookies reporting, we have a guy in Nicole Hardman, a second round pick for the Chiefs who was selected seemingly to potentially replace Tyreek Hill if he was suspended for a portion of this season. Hardman, the kind of guy who can show his speed and will build that chemistry uh, today, starting today uh, with Patrick Mahomes. So Tyreek Hill, now his availability does change things for this season. Obviously, we understand what kind of a weapon he is, but no longer does the pressure mount for a guy like Hardman. The Chiefs will have their top three uh, wide receivers, or receivers, I should say, when we include Travis Kelsey, the team's tight end, and Sammy Watkins. So we have Tyree Kill in there as well. It just raises the expectations for the team and perhaps lowers them for a guy like Hardman. But by all means, the Chiefs welcoming Tyree Kill when the veterans report on Saturday, Kerry. All right. Thank you so much for that report. Again, so Chiefs rookies and quarterbacks are reporting in the camp today. The rest of the veterans, as mentioned, report on Friday. Jeff Darlington joining us here on Coast to Coast.